Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so good to see you all today. I am Niri. I am one of the founders of Pavy. And uh, again, Pavy, we build technology for just charities uh, such as yourselves. And we are very excited to see you here today. At Pavy, my role is customer success as well as building really, really easy, simple to use interfaces so that all of you can have great success with our technology. Uh, we are very happy to host these webinar series. Again, this is something we do every so often, and our goal is to make sure we can share the knowledge that we're acquiring over the ways with all of you so that you can be more successful. Uh, we have a guest today, and I'm very excited to have her today. She is Emily. She's an auctioneer, and she's been auctioneering since 2008. What I love most about Emily is that uh, while working with clients, it's not just that she's coming there, doing her auctioneering and leaving, right? She just gets completely involved in every part of the process. And again, from what I hear from charities is with all the work that they've done with her, they're able to just scale so much more and do so much more. Uh, I'd love to welcome Emily. Hi, Emily. Hi, Nidhi. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And uh, I have a couple of my clients in the audience. So thanks um, for you um, for joining. And uh, Nidhi and I, when we were chatting before getting all ready for today, she asked me to tell her a fun fact about me. And I kind of puzzled yeah. over that for a minute. And then I realized that one of my fun facts is that um, I started auctioneering in 2008, kind of stumbled into it by accident. My very first auction was a bachelor firefighter auction for a charity um, back in 2008. And I actually met my Oakland firefighter husband at that event. He was not one of the bachelors in the auction, but uh, he helped with the whole process and um, helped me find some of the bachelors. So that's that's my fun fact for this <laughs> afternoon. No, that's awesome. I mean, it's definitely a more one of the more unique you know, stories that we've heard about yeah. people. I mean, that's one place to find <laughs> your, your match. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and, and a great way to find out that this is something that I really love doing. I mean, I, I remember the first time being on stage at an event and realizing how incredible it was to look out into this audience and realize how much power and how much energy was there ready to do one thing for one organization. And it really, um, in, you know, not to sound cliche, but it really changed my life. I mean, it, it became a huge part of my passion and what I want to focus on, which is helping people help people. That's amazing. No, I'm yeah. excited about the content that we've planned for uh, all our guests today. So yeah, let's get started, Emily. Right. I know let's you have a lot it. of stuff to share. Um, awesome. So if you see me glancing down over here, it's because I have the Pavy platform open and I'm keeping an eye on the chat. I won't be able to keep an eye on it too much. Um, but if, if you if you are chatting and you have something for me, go ahead and pop it in the chat and we'll bring it over to the private chat and I can respond to it from there. Uh, so here we are with scalable processes for nonprofits. And um, as, oh, okay. Uh, as I mentioned, I have been doing this for 13 years and the one major problem that I have seen time and time again with working with my organizations is that they don't take the time necessary to establish systems. And because of this, they end up reinventing the wheel. And I just, I see this all the time with my clients. And it really got me thinking, what, what are some pieces, what are some simple things that I can offer organizations um, that they can kind of put in place that will help them take quick action and this webinar is all about that quick action being Giving Tuesday. So that is a big piece of what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to go over the program today. We have, first we're going to talk about the donor relationship. We're going to talk about the three types of fundraising that I consult on and that I think all kind of work together synergistically. We're going to talk about systems and scalability, which if you've worked with me, you know I love these things. Uh, the magic of messaging, also a big piece of what I talk with my clients about. We're going to give you some processes and tools and resources that you can implement right away that will help you um, support all of these efforts. We're going to talk about Giving Tuesday, of course. We are going to get into creating social experiences. And boy, the last year and a half has really taught us a lot about what that means. What is a social experience? And at the very end, we are going to have a Kahoot game. And if you don't know what that is, don't go anywhere because it's lots of fun and we're going to give away prizes. 
And in the meantime, uh, we are going to draw a winner. Um, now that we've got lots of people in the room, uh, we're going to pull up this winner. So I have a year round coaching program. We meet twice a month live. You get to just talk and ask me questions. And one of you is going to get an entire year subscription to that. So uh, let's go ahead and spin the spinner. Look how neat. It's even got the PABY logo. <laughs> and uh, we need to hear Tom Keesing. If you're here, let us know in the chat because you can say winner, winner, chicken dinner, and you will be part of my Build Your Best Benefit. Would love to see Tom. Can you pop in the chat and uh, – Say I'm here. I'm I'm in. Okay, Tom. We're gonna give you. Okay, neat. You know, Nick says congratulations, Tom. We'll give Tom another minute. Should we get? Should we give another spin if Tom doesn't respond? Tom, going once. Tom, you're gonna. All right. Should we spin again? We'll give one more spin. And if Tom chimes in, then we'll 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 give him. Go ahead, spin again. So, and this is an example of social experiences. One of the many things that you can do to engage your audience, these spinners are awesome. You can use them for all sorts of things. I'm using them uh, in PB for one of my upcoming events. Jordan Bieber, are you here? Jordan Bieber, let us know in the chat if you are here and you will be our winner. We'll wait to hear from one of those two, Jordan or Tom, and we'll go ahead and keep on pushing. Okay, Jordan, you are our winner. You, uh, I will be following up with you. Congratulations. Um, I'm very excited to have you join us for Build Your Rest Benefit. Um, it's lots of fun. So let's go ahead and jump in with the content here. This is starting off with our customer. Uh, in your case, as a nonprofit, your customer is your donor, of course. And the big piece here is that just like a business follows their customer journey, you need to be thinking about following your donor journey. You need to know who your donors are. What are they about? What do they want? What's important to them? And with that, there's uh, elements of needing to maintain this customer data in some way. Now, it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, it can be as simple as you know, spreadsheets, Excel, you know, maybe you have an email list built out. Maybe you have an elaborate CRM. Uh, I encourage you to start where you are and build, but really understand that the, the key takeaway here is that you're working to build relationships and you hopefully are working to automate some of these processes. So Emily, tell us about automation. You mentioned automate. Gives me yeah. Some business. Yeah, so I've, I'm a big fan of automation, of course. Um, it can be achieved with software. You know, there's anything from setting your mailing list up to add certain tags to specific donor activity so that you can um, parcel your list and get certain messages out to certain parts of your group. Uh, but maybe if you're not that tech savvy or you're not quite there yet, you're a small organization, you're just scrapping by, automation can also be a little bit more manual in that you're creating systems and processes for when specific events happen inside of your organization. So maybe you're a brand new little school and uh, a preschool and kids enroll. Well, as soon as someone enrolls, you create a step-by-step -step system that says you need to send them a survey, send the parents a survey, get certain information. Um, you know, it, it doesn't always have to be about software. The idea though is, you know, building in mm -hmm. routines, getting them out of your head, um, onto paper so that other people can take control of those systems for you at some point. Um, yeah, so your, you know, your donors can be, or these customers, they can be on social media, they can be this network of people that love sharing about what it is that you do. Um, but again, important takeaway here is that you are in the business of building relationships. Yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. Oh. Let's talk about these three types of fundraising, um, and I'm keeping an eye on the time as we go, um, just so I don't, I'm an auctioneer, I talk a lot. Um, so uh, three types of fundraising, three types that I really think, again, are really synergistic. Um, first of all, we have um, episodic giving. What is episodic giving? This is things like International Blank Day. Uh, it could be fundraising in response to a catastrophe or a disaster some sort of newsworthy event, event response giving, so something happens and then your organization creates some sort of um, campaign around that. 
it's sometimes called rage giving, not my favorite expression, and it could be about political action. The idea here is that all of these things are probably going to happen. The example I like to give is the Red Cross. You know, the Red Cross is there because they know that emergencies and disasters and catastrophes are going to happen. So they're always ready for when that happens. And I think that that's the case for all organizations, whether it's the International Something Day or you know, maybe you're a, a dance organization and there's some huge something that comes out in the news about dance, you can be ready with a campaign, you know it's gonna happen at some point and you just, you know, you hit start on the campaign, the emails start going, communication happens. Uh, event giving, so this is obviously what a lot of us know about, um, galas, blankathons, walkathons, danceathons, things like that, bake sales, craft sales, any of these are what I would consider event giving. It's where you're putting all that effort into one sort of focused day or experience. Um, the messaging can be a little bit different around that. All three of these topics, an hour long discussion. Uh, so we're you know not gonna go into all of them uh, right now. So uh, this next one is annual giving. And you know again, this could be year end giving, annual funds, a Giving Tuesday experience, maybe your organization's anniversary or back to school. But the piece here that I think is important for you to understand is that they all work together, that the messaging around all of these fundraising efforts throughout the year needs to be consistent. We'll talk about messaging uh, in, in just a sec. So this is the crazy train. And uh, many of my clients have heard me talk about the crazy train. I really encourage my, my clients to get off the crazy train. And what does it mean? The crazy train means that you're just constantly putting out fires and you're doing things uh, that you've done before because you don't know where you put them or you it, it takes too long to figure out, you know, that's the crazy train, right? You can get off the crazy train by using systemization and using your systemization to scale. Um, a lot of people think about this stuff in terms of business, um, but I think that it all applies to nonprofits as well. Um, you know, systemization, it's, it, it allows us to examine the steps that we take so that we can uh, really evaluate the efficiency and effectiveness of whatever it is that we're doing. So when you're thinking about systems, the way that I like to teach this is if you're doing anything today that you will ever do again, take a moment to outline the steps that it took for you to get that one thing done, give it a name, give it a list. And now you've created a system around that. And when you start repeating that effort for anything that you will do more than once, you start to have systems that you can pass along to other people or know that, you know, when, um, you know, when, when your organization grows or, you know, other, other ways that you might need that kind of support. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, go ahead, maybe. Yeah, no, I was just saying, and this also helps with churn, right? And with charities, generally, there are a lot of people coming and going. And again, if it, you know, if it just hand over task to all the new people, hey, here it is, and it all already lists how it's to be done. Just take yeah. this list and just send this email out using this tool, and the credentials are already in the document. You know, yeah, just I, I'm going. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think there, there's two pieces there with churn. One is, you know, the, the staff turnover, but you've also got teams of volunteers that work with organizations and the volunteers mm -hmm. can come and go at schools. This is always one of the biggest challenges with schools is that their gala team turns over every year. So, you know, the next year you've got these new people and they've all got all these new ideas. But again, if, if someone takes the time to package it up, create some systems, then you, you really do free up resources for scaling which is all about you know, taking those efforts and growing them in mass without having to put tremendous extra effort into it. Um, so again, it's all about getting you off the crazy train. So year-round messaging, as I was saying before, um, you know, before anything else, preparation is your key to success. So take a moment to think about your messaging throughout the year, all of the different places that you plan on having asks and think about ways that you can create stories that move throughout the year so that you can be communicating information that's valuable to your audience. And we're gonna talk more about that too. Um, this is where I get very excited about my work. Um, this is processes and actions um, or you know things, things that you can do. So one, swipe copy. You can create shareable files for your team, for your volunteers, 
for your followers, for your donors. It can be as simple as a Dropbox folder or a Drive folder that is designed for you to be able to send a link and just say, hey, if you need copy or you need language or you need logos or whatever, here's a place where you can go. You can copy entire blocks of, uh, of content and paste it into whatever it is. And I love these sorts of things because so often I talk to organizations and they say that they're noticing that there's um, kind of a, a mismatch of how their board is conveying what it is that they do. And that is easily solved by having swipe copy available. Uh, there's something that I call template brain. This is where, again, once, if you're doing something one time and you know that you'll be doing it again, create a template. So it's just turning that switch on in your mind and asking yourself, should I create a template for this? Almost always the answer is yes. Um, and I would say, I even do that in my personal life. Um, my, my kids tease me, I have a spreadsheet for Hanukkah presents and um, we have three kids. So Hanukkah is a very busy time in our house. Um, but I made the spreadsheet and I have a template of it. And every year I just copy that page of the spreadsheet and you know rework it. So it's, uh, and it saves me time, it's great. Um, and then Loom, oh, one of my favorite tools. Um, Loom is a very, very easy to use screen recording system where you can walk through the steps of whatever your actions are and tell somebody, you voice over all of the steps that you're taking and why you're taking them. And then all of a sudden you now have a recording of you doing that task. You can pass that recording onto someone else and they can now do that task. Is very exciting. My friend, this your swipe copy is pretty interesting, right? It's amazing how many charities we speak to, and we ask them, "Hey, what's your mission statement?" Right? And you speak to three people, and they'll all have again the gist is the same, but then they'll say it a little differently, right? And again, consistency makes a big difference, right? It's and huge because I mean, when you right. think about businesses, I mean, brand is so crucial, and brand consistency is so crucial, and your nonprofit is no different, right? And sometimes it's very nuanced. You really need to make sure that people are articulating what it is that you do accurately so that, you know, you don't have board members going around saying, you know, we're curing cancer when that's not exactly what you do, right? Um, mm -hmm. So just helping make sure that all your messaging is on brand. Um, another one of my favorite ones, uh, tools and resources. Um, this is a short list, um, Canva. If you, already, if you don't already know Canva, Canva should be your new best friend. Um, it is free for nonprofits and um, basically it's graphic design software, super fun to use. My kids use it, I use it all the time. Um, one of the great things is that you can design something in Canva and you can click a, link or click a button and it'll resize that to whatever format for social media. So again, when you're building that swipe copy folder to want to mm -hmm. put together easy to share resources, you can design something and then make a Facebook header and an Instagram uh, post Instagram story, Facebook post, whatever, all the things, and you know, Canva will automatically do it for you. Um, I mentioned Loom. Uh, Loom can also be great for other communications, and I think that one of my clients that's on here has used Loom for um, reaching out to big donors. But what I like it for is, you know, emails are dry, and they're, you know, nobody likes reading and responding to emails, but. With Loom, you can push a button, record a quick, you know, 20, 30, 40 second video. It creates a link. You pop that right in. Actually, there is um, there's a plugin in Gmail. So if you use Gmail, it's even easier. And instead of sending someone an email, you send them a quick video. So it could be to a board member or a donor like, mm -hmm. hey, Sarah, you know, we noticed that you haven't bought a table for the gala yet. We really want you to be there. We had such a great time with you last year. Let me know if you have any, you know, questions, right? That's powerful. That's relationship mm -hmm. building. Um, this is a fun one, <laughs> kind of a, a, a small small fish in a big pond. Uh, Hello Whoopi, I don't have a ton of experience with them because um, I am not the best at social media, but I'm working on it. Um, but one of the things that they do is they can help you generate um, automated AI enhanced social media and blog posts um, plus social media scheduling across platforms. So if you are um, a social media heavy organization, you might want to check that one out. Um, Nidhi introduced me to this one, which is pretty cool. If you're video heavy, this one is called Repurpose. Um, you can make a video and it will automatically um, 
put the subtitles and then give you all the, the aspect ratios to be able to post it again simultaneously cross platform. Um, so that one's pretty cool. Free QR generator. Um, oh, I meant to have a little example. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of QR codes and um, so is Pavey. And I didn't realize how much I loved them until we were in the virtual space and we were doing things like sending a, a box of goodies to a house and we would put the QR code for the virtual event on their little program. There's a million ways to use QR codes. A lot of people don't realize that they're free to generate. Um, Fiverr and Upwork. If you have small tasks or projects that you need to outsource, these can be great ways to get those things done on a budget. Um, and using contractors and virtual assistants, huge help. I think that a lot of organizations have this idea that they have to do everything themselves or they have to do everything in-house or that these things will be very expensive and that is not the case. Um, and I've already, I've already put a bug in Nadie's ear about virtual assistants. My virtual assistant <laughs> is backstage helping us right now and I would not be able to function without him. So, um, you know, get help. That's, you know, the big, the big piece here is do what you're good at and get help with the things that you're not good at. Um, and maybe you're a little mind blown right now um, and that's okay. Um, maybe don't have any of these things in place. Uh, you know, start where you are. And that's, I think, a, a good moment to just ask yourself, like, what do we have? What, what do we have and where could we go with it? So maybe you have phone numbers already. Then text people, do something, communicate with them. Uh, maybe you have a social media following. Automate that to help build your list. Maybe, you know, find, um, um, oh, oh, Zapier. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but, you know, figure oh. out ways to scrape that information from your social media, add it to your list and, you know, grow both of those things all at the same time. Maybe you have a list, automate it to grow your social, have a campaign for your list to get people to follow you on social media. And with that, know where you're going. What are your goals? What are you trying to do? Uh, Giving Tuesday isn't all about raising money. It's about raising awareness. It's about growing your community, your list of donors. And we'll talk about some psychology around that in just a second. Um, but with that, how will you know when you made it? So give yourself some concrete goals. Like we want to get 50 new followers by whenever. And then think about how can we do that? What are some efforts that we can put in place to get that done? Um, let's talk about Giving Tuesday because it's right around the corner. Uh, oh, November 20th. Oh, yeah, I guess I just realized all it's away. I know, I know. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It really, it's sneaking up on us. And, uh, okay. but here we are. So November 30th, uh, Giving Tuesday was launched in 2012, which is funny because it feels like it's been around forever, but maybe not. Um, it's all about grassroots generosity. And I think that that's a, a real key piece um, to, to think about with all of this is that, yes, it's about donating, but it's about creating grassroots effort and, and really communicating with your audience and your donors that what they do matters, that it's important for them to show up. So let's talk about what it's, you know, what is it all about? First off, it's again, a day that encourages people to do good. So your messaging can just be all around doing good. And I think that it kind of plays on some of the, uh, how people feel after Thanksgiving and maybe Black Friday and the shopping and the eating and this idea of like getting back into your work week and feeling like, okay, now, now I feel like maybe I wanna do something or give something back. Um, it's not just about uh, donations. It can be about a day of action. So maybe your campaign is getting people to share about your organization. And maybe that's what you're trying to do is just get more eyes on what you do. Um, this is a big one this year is for me, because I think this is important. Uh, there's a lot of conversation around supply chain issues and the holidays and all of these things. And I think that it's an opportunity for us to communicate to our donors that gift giving doesn't have to be material, that you can donate to organizations that you know would be exciting or important to people that you love. Um, so that could be part of your Giving Tuesday campaign as well. But most excitingly, we saw between 2019 and 2020, this is from uh, the Giving Tuesday organization from their website, 29% more giving. Uh, so despite the pandemic, Giving Tuesday uh, reported participants gave $2.47 billion. Um, so get in there. 
get engaged, get people, um, you know, get people giving. I love language around, um, you know, philanthropy as a type of gifting that, you know, participation, it's not what you give, it's that you give, that we can do so much together, that if 100% of our uh, social media followers gave just $10, we would be able to do blank. Um, again, all about engagement and, you know, statistics show that once you get somebody to say yes to you, getting them to say yes again is a lot easier. And I guess here it's also more about building relationship, right? Again, uh, you know, yep. no, no matter how much they donate, the fact that they have a connection with you, uh, whatever kind of connection, right? It is the fact that they know about the work that you do or that they gave you $5. And tomorrow, if they wanted to give to a charity, you should pop up in their brain first. That's right. Um, and there's, you know, lot, lots more around marketing there. Um, so what, is all, what does all that mean for your organization? People are expecting to hear something from nonprofits and honestly from companies also around Giving Tuesday. So you've got to speak up. And I think that there are, I've heard from clients that there's this idea, this sort of apologetic idea of like, oh, well, you know, we don't, we don't want to, I don't know, we don't want to overwhelm people or we don't want to be too annoyed. Yes, you need to. You have to, you have to send something out. You've got to let them know that you're there because if you're not, someone else is. Um, so what should you do? Well, you could do a text to give campaign. You could have some kind of gamified social sharing. Hey, folks, share this stuff and you'll be entered into a, a drawing to win, blah, blah, blah. Use this hashtag. I am not a social media expert. So, you know, maybe go on Fiverr and find someone who is. Um, you can have a days of giving campaign. And I actually, I really like this one. It could be something where every day leading up or right after um, Giving Tuesday, you send ideas of things that your audience could do to give or to share or days of gratitude, you know, something for them, conversation starters at dinner for kids in schools. Uh, you could have an online auction and it doesn't have to be related to your uh, live event. That's kind of an aha moment for a lot of schools. You could have an end of the year holiday online auction. You could look for engagement opportunities. Again, not even looking for fundraising, but just looking for ways to engage your audience. You could have a raffle. You could get creative. There's all kinds of things you could do. Uh, and then, yeah. Yeah, no, I was just saying, I love all these ideas because it seems like it's not location bound or it's not limited to the, hey, can I just do this online? These could all go hybrid, right? They could go yeah. online, they could also go in person and uh, suit everybody no matter where they are. Yeah, and I honestly, I think that, you know, that virtual piece and the hybrid piece is, it's really showing us how to stay connected to donors that are maybe not in our geographic vicinity. Um, but that leads us to giving something before you expect to get something. And this is something that I see a lot of my clients missing. Uh, your donors want to get value from you and they don't want to just hear from you when you're asking for money, because if you send them emails asking for money over and over again, they're going to stop opening those emails. So, um, what can you get? Giving Tuesday gave a great example. So this is on Canva. This is a folder, a shareable folder. So that full swipe file idea, they set it up on Canva. It's a public link. I put it in the slideshow, um, easy to find on their website. You can make something like this. You can have a link to this on your website where it's very easy for your donors to get, uh, you know, easy to download images or graphics. Um, you can also put together infographics. I'm a big fan of infographics. So have these available. Maybe, if, again, if you're looking for an engagement campaign around Giving Tuesday, have those resources ready to go. Send them in the emails. Make it easy for your donors. I cannot overemphasize that. Um, and actually, I was in a Facebook group today, and I saw a woman that was had started a text campaign, and she had it was a small list. She had nine click-throughs, but only three people, because after I guess after you, like, text the word donate and then it sends a link back that only three people followed through on that. It's another example of just making things as easy as possible because everyone is busy and needs things available and ready and easy to do whatever the thing is. Uh, it's also up there with like when we used to send out letters and we found, uh, you know, with the return response that if you put the stamp 
on the return envelope that you were significantly more likely to get donations than if you didn't put the stamp on the envelope. So that was that was a conversation back when I started working with nonprofits. Do we put a stamp on the envelope or not? I don't even know. Not not as many people are doing that. But um, point being but here, it's amazing, right? Charity, I guess donors want to give. They want to support you. But absolutely. just make it easy for them. Just make absolutely. it easy. Think through their side of the process. Make it easy and the results will show. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, everyone's busy. Uh, and think about what it is that you're actually asking them to do. Uh, so some other experiences that you could do. There are lots and lots of ways that you can have virtual um, fun experiences you can offer people. All these can be done inside of Payby. Movie night, talent show, trivia game, uh, which we're going to do with real prizes. So don't go anywhere. Don't miss that game because you have chances to win good stuff. Um, you can do karaoke. There's somebody that does online karaoke, social challenges, bingo, clothing swaps, all kinds of things um, that, you know, that can really give that value to your audience, give them something before you expect to get something. Um, so without further ado, I think that we should jump into this Kahoot game. So uh, let us know in the chat if you have ever done a Kahoot. If you have or haven't, let us know. In the meantime, get your phone and log in. You do not need the Kahoot app. So no, no app downloading here. Don't worry about that. You can scan the, um, Oh, yay, we've got lots of new ones. So Kahoot is very popular with uh, schools. The kids do it all the time with their teachers. So what you're going to do first is scan the QR code um, with your phone so that you can log into the Kahoot game. And uh, we're, we want to get in this really quickly. So get your phone out. You can scan the QR code and um, um, you, or you can go to www.kahoot.it and um, the website and the game pin are in the chat. And while you're logging in, I am going to show you the prizes. So we're gonna have three prizes, three winners, just like you see this little, you know, Olympic style situation. The first person who wins is going to have their choice of two years of, um, of Haiti, um, which is very exciting, or five hours of one-on-one -on -one consultation time with me. That means you can talk about whatever it is that you want, although maybe I'm not a good therapist, but I'm really good at talking about fundraising. Um, and then the third option is a combination of three hours of one-on-one -on -one consultation with Haiti and a three-day, two-night Cancun vacation. Yes, you saw it here. So the way that it works, uh, everybody get logged in. Let us, how about you give us like a thumbs up or a I'm in or something like that in the chat just so that we know that people are in. Um, again, get your phones out. Uh, it's gonna be fun, I promise, and it's not gonna be very challenging. All right, we've got, yep, the code again, 3973767. Jennifer's in, Ariel's in. Amador County Fair Foundation is in. Um, all right, game pin 397. So in the game, we've got B, Ming, Ariel, Moose, Will, Chaya, sorry, I'm mispronouncing your name, Lucy, Stephanie, and Morgan, Erica. All right, anybody else? Last call, last call before we move into the game. If you need any help before we jump into the game, let us know I need help so that we don't start the game without you. All right, we're gonna go start the game in just a couple of seconds. Okay, cats in, Jen's in, Rod's in. This is great, okay, we're getting there. Um, so as we're getting set up, I will just point out, so this is something that you could easily do at one of your payday fundraising events. Um, in fact, maybe you have your school and you're trying to motivate your kids to motivate the parents to attend the event. You, If you say Kahoot, the kids are gonna be there. They're excited about it. You can have a you know, popsicle party for the, you know, whichever person wins, there's all kinds of ways that you can integrate it. It's really fun and super easy to set up. Um, all right, anybody else? Last call, last call. Um, and Super Neek is gonna get us started. So keep your phone out. The questions are gonna come up on the screen and you are gonna answer. And then we only have, I think, it, oh, Jordan, I hope we didn't lose you. Oh no, we might not have gotten Jordan in on the action. At least you already won something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the names of your webinar presenters are? All right. 
So I guess everybody hits hits the icon or you know the pattern on your phone to kind of yeah. match the answers and as quickly as possible, right? Timing matters too. Yes, timing does matter. And also we're we're just in it for fun. All right, let's go on to the next one. <laughs> I get competitive. <laughs> I can see that. All right, Erica was the one that got it. Okay, so again, you're gonna see the question, you're gonna answer by pushing the buttons on your phone. There's no question. Dun, 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 dun. The qu <laughs> we, somehow that didn't happen. All no, right. it's right there. There is the oh, question. No, no, on top, the white bar. Okay. We do have it there, yeah. I don't think it popped up on the last screen for some reason. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Ooh, Erica's in the lead. Erica's in the lead. <laughs> Which type of fundraising was not mentioned in the webinar? Event, episodic, capital, or annual? Which one was not mentioned? All right, we've got 11 answers. All right, y'all are yeah, yeah, I'm glad it's right. <laughs> there we go. All right, let's see if that shuffled some things around because it, it does go by time as well. Erica's still on top, then Lucy, then Jen K. Let's go on to the next. Systemization examines the steps we take in any given action so we can All right, that's right. Evaluate efficiency and effectiveness. Let's move on. Erica still in the lead with a Stephanie climbing up. Swipe copy is language you. Stole from someone else. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, we're six out of 11, halfway through, go ahead. All right, Erica is still our reigning champion. If you don't already have systems in place, you should. All right. Oh, <laughs> I like this dynamic <laughs> board. <laughs> it, it is fun. All right, let's keep it going. And remember, it's all for fun. And all of this can be adjusted when you set up your own. Giving Tuesday started in what year? Who knows? All right, now that should shuffle it up a bit. Ooh, look at Morgan. You said all the way Morgan in the lead, Lucy. All right, let's go. We've got eight out of 11 more questions. Giving Tuesday is all about. Nine, nine, ten. All right. Looks like we got everybody. You guys are smart. I get very competitive about these two. True or false, nonprofits do not need to give value to their donors because their donors don't expect it. All right. Let's shuffle up the scores at all. No, Morgan's still on top. Let's keep going. Two more questions. If you are a top winner of this Kahoot, your first <laughs> prize choice would be let us know which one would you pick if you are the first prize winner. Thought that would be a big one. <laughs> All right, and one more question. I learned something new in this webinar. Let us know. It's okay. Feelings won't be hurt. All right, good. <laughs> We say that to all the Kahoots. All right, so we're gonna see our winners in just a moment. Win first place, no, third place, we have Jen K. In second place, we have Stephanie. And in first place, we have Morgan. Yay! All right, <laughs> so we're gonna pull those uh, prizes back up and uh, we are gonna, let's see, Morgan, let us know. 
<laughs> let us know what prize you'd like. You have two years of KD. You have one-on-one -on -one consultation with me, which you already get, and uh, mm -hmm. a tropical vacation. So Morgan, let us know which prize would you like. She wants the vacay because she already <laughs> has me. It's true. All right. So in second <laughs> place is Stephanie. You have five hours of consultation with me or two years of virtual of a uh, of Katie. Uh, let's hear what you would like, Stephanie. You've got two more to choose. Sorry, Erica, you didn't win. Bummer. All right, waiting to hear from Stephanie. You've got your choice of five hours of consultation. Awesome. So I will be reaching out to you. Thank you, and Neek, if you can make a note of that. And our final winner, Jen K, you just won two years of KB. Um, thank you, Erica. I appreciate that very much. Um, so that is one of the many ways that you can use uh, even virtual experiences to have lots of fun. I have a whole host of, um, of resources and activities and things like this, um, some that are free, some that are cheap, some that are a little more expensive, but more interactive. So if you're looking, especially for holidays, if you're still working in remote spaces, there are a lot of things like this that I think are legitimately fun for teams to do. Hopefully that wasn't too painful for you. Hopefully you had a good, a good time with that. Um, so we are taking questions. We've got, um, we've got a little bit of time. Happy to, uh, happy to hear what kinds of questions, what things come up. Oh, good. I'm glad that that was fun, Stephanie. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Let us know if you have any questions before you hop off and um, y'all have my contact information, but feel free I to reach out. I have a couple of questions for you. Emily. Yeah, for sure. So while you're waiting for uh, everybody to think something. So yeah. if, if I was a charity and you know we are starting from scratch and we just had to get somebody to help us get started, what kind of skill set would we look for? Oh, so there's a couple things here. So one is usually charities are starting, uh, that they're starting, it's because someone is really passionate about something and there are lots and lots of things that need to get done. So a really awesome piece of advice that I received um, in running my business, which I think applies to charities, is make a list of the 10 things that you spend time doing or that you think you need to spend time doing. And then put them in order with the ones at the top of the things that you're good at or you like doing or you feel capable of. And then the 10 would be the thing that you're not good at and you have no idea what you're doing and you're probably not capable of it. And start off by finding three the people to do the bottom three things. So tasks 10, nine, and eight, the things that you're the worst at or can't do or don't know how to do, find someone to do those things. So it could be as simple as, you know, again, taking the task and posting it on Upwork or finding a, a virtual assistant that can manage those pieces for you so that you can focus on the things that you are best at and that are most important to you. Mm -hmm. um, and we did get a question. Um, mm -hmm. You wanna read it? Yeah, no, uh, there's, uh, Amador County Fair is asking for ideas for the timing of your Giving Tuesday communication. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> doing water. Um, so, really soon is the first answer. Um, if you're putting together a, a complex campaign, you really need to get your pieces in line pretty quickly. Um, if that means you know planning out your email marketing campaign. I have already started receiving emails that mention Giving Tuesday, um, not a ton of them, but I would say you're gonna start sending emails related to whatever your campaign is probably the week before. Um, it, it, it depends on the scale and the engagement that you're looking for for your donors. If you're asking them to do a lot, if you're just asking them to donate, if there's maybe you have a matching challenge, if they give on the certain day, then you might want to advertise go leading up to that. But I think that if you're feeling a little bit behind the eight ball on timing with Giving Tuesday, I think it's okay to launch a campaign on Giving Tuesday. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a fundraising campaign. It could be, again, an engagement campaign where you say, starting on Giving Tuesday, we are gonna send a 10-day series of gratitude emails you know, that um, people might wanna open that are, you know, again, those conversation starters for families or things like that. I think anything, again, that gives value and gets your audience opening your emails, which is also really good for your email deliverability and um, just technically very, very helpful. Um, 
So I would say, even though the idea normally is to get your campaign ready so that you can launch on Giving Tuesday, I think you have some flexibility around that where you can, you know, you could start something that continues into the holidays. I'm even thinking we could always start posting, hey, we're going to be participating in Giving Tuesday this year, right? Just so that your community knows that, you know, you're going to be participating and they can expect something from you. So it could just be that yeah. or just Giving Tuesday is coming up in a few days. And yes, yeah. again, what are we I, looking and, for? Small things. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think that that's mm-hmm. actually really important because a lot of individual giving kind of happens at the end of the year where people realize that they still have money that they haven't given or they realize that their businesses have a match that resets at the end of the year. So if you start planting that seed, like, hey, don't forget to check to see if your your uh, employer matches donations, um, you know, maybe you have a chance of getting some of the, the end of the year giving in. Uh, how do you prevent donor fatigue at end of year? Um, this is always a hard one. Um, I think, I mean, I think donor fatigue happens year round in some ways with organizations, um, especially if it's your core donors. Um, some of it is asking yourself if you, do you really need to have that push at the end of the year for your institutional budget? Is, is that why you're doing end of year giving or are you doing end of year giving because that's what everybody does? Um, if you're doing it because it's what everybody does, I think it might be important to take a step back Ask yourself what your organization, your your donors are about. Um, get into the meat of who they are and what is of value to them and see if maybe a better strategy might be to start an engagement campaign at the end of the year and look for giving, you know, maybe January, February, March. Um, I, I think there isn't one right answer. And I think that what I see often happens with organizations is they start doing what everybody else is doing and that often feels like what everyone else is doing to your donor. And what you mm-hmm. want to do, again, because it's about relationship building, is thinking about what you can do that sets yourself apart, that sets your organization apart from the other organizations and makes that relationship feel special. I have another question for you, Emily. I, sure. I always like to get examples, right, just so that all our charities can think through their setup and their processes. So if you could give an example of maybe an organization you worked with and, you know, well, tell us a little bit about where they were when you started working with them and then getting processes and results. I know, again, consulting is a big part of what you do. So yes. please tell us. Yeah, so I always joke with my clients that ultimately, aside from their live event and me doing the auctioneering at their event, that with the consultation, like I would like to phase myself out of working with organizations. So oftentimes I'll work with organizations in a very in-depth way um, to get their systems in place and then pull back so that they are not paying me anymore. And then I'm just showing up to do the live auction, the live fundraising. So one example I can think of, actually, I was going to give a different example and I thought of this before, but um, the easiest example is actually that bachelor firefighter auction. So this was a tiny organization. Um, They did not have a lot of support. And uh, when I showed up, they had a date for the venue or a date and a venue for the event and they had nothing else in place. They had been doing this event many, many, many times, but Uh, I think actually the year I came, it was like their ninth year that they had done it. So I asked for any materials or resources that they had. They had nothing. And so one of the things that I did, it actually took me three years with this organization, which is normal for building with an organization. We also built a formal gala for the same organization, is that we created that template that it it was sort of the, the manual of how to run these two events, the spring event and the fall event. And it was deep. I, it was There was a written book that I worked on for them that was the step-by-step guide of how to run the bachelor auction, how to run the fall gala. We had the, uh, the Google Drive folder that had all of the resources there that they could copy, update, edit, so that they weren't writing that, you know, donation letter every single year or that, you know, mm-hmm. they weren't writing the, you know, solicitation letter every single year. Um, so I really think that was one of my best examples of, and then also what we saw is the year before I was with them on their event, they raised, it was again, a small organization. I think they raised $10,000 in the year that I worked with them and put the systems in place. They raised 22,000 at the same event. So doubled just because we had built these systems so that again, 
there, what I talk about with my clients is getting the development team to focus on high yield activities that only they can do. Because there's there are those people that are in your organization that speak with passion, right? They're not the ones that we want digging through the data. We want them on the phone and out in the world and talking to people. So as much as we can build to free them up to have those high yield uh, tasks and activities. Um, I see a question. Um, if, Dinat has one for you. Can you speak more to the days of giving campaign idea as it relates to giving Tuesday and some examples? Yeah, so this is one that I kind of started thinking about, and, and it really came from me thinking about what would I like to get from an organization instead of 10 emails that ask for money. Um, so days of giving that I would imagine are um, getting a series of emails from an organization that give me prompts for things that I can do for myself. Maybe you're a mental health you know, organization, and this can be you know, we know that the holidays are very difficult. So here is a series of 10 emails of, you know, giving back to yourself. Day one, take a bath. Day two, carve out 20 minutes to drink tea and read a magazine on the sofa. Day three, uh, write in your journal for 15 minutes. Um, you know, prompts, again, if I, if I knew that this series of emails were coming from an organization, I would open them because it's inspiring and it is giving value to me and it's related to the organization. Um, again, another one that I think would be really valuable for schools are these conversation prompts. And I've mentioned that a couple of times. And again, as a parent, I have three kids, we have very, very busy household and family dinner is super, super important for our family. And we talk pretty openly and about whatever. Um, but I think that if we had some sort of emails that were coming in that was like today's conversation prompt is um, how do you know you how do you how do you know when you are loved and that was and again sometimes as a parent like if I were to ask that question my kids would be like okay mom you're being a big dork right but if I said like hey I'm on this mailing list that's sending me this you know mm -hmm. days of gratitude thing and I thought it would be fun let's do this they'd be like okay sure Definitely great ideas there. Uh, and then kind of this trigger, this thought got triggered, right? That how does a charity know if a gala is the right fundraising channel for them? Or is it more of these little things that they should do? Or how do they decide what is going to give them the best returns? Um, the effort. <laughs> oh, boy, that is a really, really good question. So I, again, putting myself out of work sometimes I will get on consultation calls with new clients and they have never had an event or they're thinking or they've had events but they haven't been very successful and I kind of peel back the curtains with them and then where we land is I I really don't think that having a live event is a smart move for you um, it's not for everyone there you know live events um, fundraising events are a tremendous strain on the resources of an organization um, so the first Kind of indicators for me when I am evaluating whether a live gala is the right decision for a client is um, you need to have multiple goals. So fundraising is a good goal for a live event, but it can't be your only one. You need to be doing it because you are trying to grow your audience. And if that is one of the goals, then you need to think about how you're going to do that at your event. Do not expect that people are just going to show up at your event. You've got to get people out there you know, marketing and pushing and getting their friends to come to your event. Um, maybe it's to reinvigorate your donor list. They have, maybe you haven't had an event in a long time. Maybe it's community building. Um, but all of that needs to be taken into consideration with the operations of the organization and how much bandwidth it's going to take to make that happen and what that bandwidth is getting pulled away from. So again, that goes back to your executive director or your development director right now picking napkins for their live event and they had to drive to the rental warehouse to pick out the right color napkins when they could have been on the phone making three phone calls and raising, you know, five to $10,000. Um, so I think 
that that's the stuff that I really like to consult on and have those one on one conversations if someone is like we're not quite sure what to do and thinking about it um especially with someone outside of the organization because another flaw mm-hmm. I see is that people inside the organization assume that everyone loves the organization as much as you do and as much as I wish that was the case it's not um and people people are busy we're just busy <laughs> Um, you know, so really thinking about what the right efforts are um, to meet people where they are. And I do think times are changing as well, right? I mean, sometimes I hear charities say, oh, we're doing a gala just because we do one every year. I mean, that is definitely not a reason, right? No. Yes. I mean, <laughs> just doing yeah. it, we've done. And again, it might not be appropriate. The times have changed. The ways yeah. to reach donors have changed as well. So again, I, I think it should be a continuous process of reevaluation and then see what's right. Maybe yeah, the and community is also changing, right? Maybe they're not yeah. going to drive up to a gala or they're exactly. all younger now. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and even, yeah, the format of the gala might need to change. And that was that's mm-hmm. something that I've seen with uh, some of my school clients that have, had done kind of the auction gala thing year after year after year. And we started to see attendance declining and we had to ask ourselves like, what's going on, why are these not as successful as they were? And, you know, even some simple polls, just asking around, like, well, what's the problem? And people are like, well, we don't, we just want to party. Like, we we don't really want to have, you know, 17 live auction items. So we reevaluated and, you know, with a lot of my clients, we, we slashed the live auction down to a handful of items. Um, we made sure that the majority of the time there was fun and engaging and community building, but in the messaging, because I think that this is a big part of the success mm-hmm. of any fundraising campaign, is that in the marketing and the communication, it was, hey, we heard you, we listened, we know that you want to come and party, we know you want to visit with other parents and that fundraising that night isn't the big priority, but here's the ask. We need you to show up in the online auction, we need you to buy the raffle tickets so that the school can still raise the money and it worked, mm-hmm. you know? Definitely. meeting people where they are yeah this is so fun i i love this i think uh, <laughs> so nice. morgan is bragging about my so much of love. <laughs> thank right. you we're reaching the end of our hour uh, i want yes. to thank you emily for your time with us this has been so much fun and experience Thanks. as well i i learned so many new things and thank you for coming to our webinar. yeah Okay. It's my pleasure. I, I love working with you all. I love, I mean, you know, I love the platform so much. And um, I'll say it took me a long time to find something that I just, I, I really enjoyed interacting with. And this is just a, a very pleasant setup. So thank you all of you for coming, joining in person. We really appreciate it. We know, we know everybody's busy and it's nice to have some, uh, some actual in-person, uh, in-person time. So thanks so much. Thanks to Stephanie. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> And we will reach out with all the winners and tell you how you can get your big prizes. Thank you. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye.